Hello and welcome back to Millennial Love, a podcast from The Independent on everything to do with love, sexuality, identity and more. I am so happy that we are back. Not only that, we are back as a video series as well as a podcast. So as well as listening to us on all the regular platforms, you can now watch us too on Independent TV. So for our very first episode of the season, I am thrilled to be joined by clinical psychologist, Dr. Michaela Dunbar. She is the founder of My Easy Therapy and the author of a brilliant book called You've Got This, Seven Steps to a Life You Love. Today, we are going to talk about all sorts of hurdles that can stop you from having the relationship and the love life that you want. Hi, Michaela, how are you doing? I am very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Um, so tell us a little bit about what it is that you do mm-hmm. and how your platform, My Easy Therapy, led to the book. Okay, so I am a clinical psychologist and I basically support all kinds of people at different ages with difficulties with their mental health, their psychological and emotional well-being. And I do this through talking therapy. So talking with people back and forward, and kind of, I call myself a problem solver because people come to me with their problems. I kind of dissect them, figure out what's going on for them and give them the steps to be able to transform their lives and their mental health in the direction that they want to. So I started off in the NHS as all clinical psychologists in this country do anyway. And I realized that I was repeating a lot of the same conversations with all of the people I worked with, regardless of the age. And I always thought to myself, and you probably hear a lot of therapists say this, but why don't they teach this stuff in schools? Mm. We get taught a lot of good stuff in school, but actually we don't get taught about, I'm gonna call this human survival. We don't get taught about how to manage our emotions. We are, we are born with emotions and they keep us alive. But unfortunately, sometimes struggles with emotions can actually end up killing us. But again, this is not something that's talked about. So I'm in the NHS and as I said, I'm repeating these things and I'm like, okay, how do I get this out, this information out to as many people as possible, but make it as easily accessible as possible? Remember, in this country, in the UK, there is still a stigma around mental health, not necessarily so much in different countries overseas, but here we don't want to talk about it. We have the stiff upper lip, we just get on with it and it kills us. So I didn't want to keep this information just for the people that could wait on the NHS waiting list or had the money to spend thousands on a therapist. So then the Instagram page came about. I literally didn't even have social media before I started this, no. But I was just like, okay, I don't particularly love social media because of the comparisonitis, you know, all that kind of stuff that happens. But I know that a lot of people are on social media all across the world and that's how my easy therapy came about. And the platform, it just grew. And I think because of the topic, people were like, so I would write stuff about um, feeling anxious when you wake up in the morning. Or, you know, always, I did used to post about, you know, always being in unsuccessful relationships and where that comes from. And actually, is it always the other person? Are we choosing people because of how we regulate our emotions, because of trauma, because of attachment difficulties? And people were reaching out and they were saying, you get it, like reading your posts, that just seemed, I'm reading every one and I'm like, that's me, that's me, that's me. Mm. So I knew I was onto something. And then the page people share and then the, the Instagram page just blew up from there basically. It's amazing. I mean, it's 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 brilliant because, like you said, it makes all of this advice so accessible. And, you know, therapy is really inaccessible in this country for a lot of people. Like you said, there are huge waiting lists. Mm-hmm. And if you don't go through the NHS, it's very expensive. And so when you went about writing the book, how did you go through the process of choosing which things to include? And how much of that was influenced by your audience, I suppose, and the the queries that they come to you with? Because I'm sure you get plenty of DMs from your followers asking yeah, you for help. Absolutely, my DMs are out of control <laughs> at this point. Um, so the book actually is, is 50-50, it's, it's half of what I went through. And I talk about that through the book, my experience with all of these things, all of these topics in here, imposter syndrome, anxiety, people pleasing, all of that kind of stuff, that was me. But not only was it me, and uh, it was also a lot of the women that I was working with. This is in, it, in the NHS and also once I left the NHS as well, because I left only a couple of years ago to go into private practice full time. And that's at the same time as the page. So I've got people, I've got myself, my own experience, 
Then I've got the clients that I work with one to one saying the same things to me about imposter syndrome. They're mm. doing really, really well. And there's always this air of shame around it. Like, why do I feel like this? I've got a really good job. I've got enough money coming in. You know, my life is objectively, it feels great, but I don't feel great. And I feel even worse about the fact that I've got all of this stuff and I don't feel great about it. Those conversations in the one in the one to one therapy sessions were also happening in the DMs too, in the comments of the um, of the posts I used to make. And it was a lot of I'm here, but I doubt myself a lot. Mm. I don't trust myself to make decisions. I feel anxious going up to even just waking up in the morning, knowing that I've got a full day ahead. I don't know how to say no. I feel like if I say no to opportunities at work, even relationships, if I say no, if I set a boundary, then the opportunity might not come up again. Or people might see me as like, like a weak, like I can't handle things. Mm. I need to just, and I'm not supposed, this is the imposter syndrome piece. I'm not supposed to be here anyway. I just got this job or I just got with this person because, you know, I slip through. They don't really know who I am. So if I start to turn things down and say no and not be a, a perfect, then people are going to really see who I am and then I'll get rejected or abandoned or fired. So these are the conversations I'm having constantly. And I thought, you know what? This needs to go into a book. This needs to go into, people need to understand that there are so many people. And I say women, but there's a lot of men too in my comments. I think because of the, the way my page is set up is pink, it's girly, like it attracts women. But there's a lot of men also that experience the same things. I chose women because I am a woman and, and I really get it, you know, because I've, I've been there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm the same. I mean, I always say the same with this podcast, like it's for everyone. But fundamentally, there is something in me that, you know, I want to help women and, you know, people of minority genders and non-binary people and trans women, because to me, they need the most help. <laughs> but that's not to say that men don't need help, too. <laughs> they do. But it's just that that's my kind of view of it, I guess. Um, so I'm interested in what you said about imposter syndrome, because I think that is a term that we typically apply to the workplace. Mm. And while that definitely has value and you talk about that in the book, it's interesting to contextualize with it, that within relationships, isn't mm -hmm. it? Because we wouldn't normally think about how that affects the choices that we make in our romantic lives. Absolutely. So how do you think that operates and how do we get out of that system, you know? Because especially as women, we are conditioned to, to have mm -hmm. imposter syndrome, which is why it, it makes sense to talk about it like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, tell me what you think um, that's all about. I think it's just this underlying feeling that some of us have of just not being good enough. Mm. And if you don't feel good enough as a person, that is gonna apply to every area of your life, whether you're in a job or not, whether you're in a relationship or not, when you have children, if these things are always going to come up if that's your core belief about yourself and unfortunately lots of us have different uh, difficult experiences growing up and our environment unfortunately gives us the impression or we interpret it as we're not good enough and we hold on to these subconscious core beliefs not knowing that we have these subconscious core beliefs but then we lead with them in conversation we lead with them when we're dating an example is you know you go you meet somebody on i don't know the latest whatever it is now you go for a date, you're like, oh my gosh, they're out of my league. Automatically, mm. you're not, they're now on the pedestal because you don't feel good enough. You don't know anything about this person. You don't just know that they look cute. Like, so, so then this is the imposter syndrome. And you could have imposter syndrome. You could think that, you could think, oh gosh, this person's out of my league. But you can still show up as a confident, you know, intelligent, whatever it is, person, that good stuff that you've got. You could still show up in that way. But we don't usually do that. We usually act in line with our negative core beliefs. Unless we're aware of them, of our negative core beliefs, we usually show up in that way. Those, I see core beliefs as like the glasses that you wear. This is how we, everybody's got different glasses on. But if your core belief is I'm not good enough, then you're gonna have those glasses on all the time and you're gonna approach all situations with those glasses on, mm. which might mean that you misinterpret certain things that people say to you or certain actions. Or you give the impression to other people, to the person that you're dating, the person that you're on a date with, that you don't feel good enough about yourself. And sometimes people can subconsciously as well use that to their advantage and start to treat you badly based off of how you talk about yourself and how mm. you treat yourself. And then you end up sometimes attracting situations where, you know, the person might not be the best for you. They might be a little, a little bit narcissistic or you know, just not 
just not the person that you deserve and that you, sh- you know, you, you might be happy with long term, but you stick with them because we always want approval, especially if you've got that not good enough core belief, you always want approval from the person that's not giving it to you. Yeah. So you you have all the other people around you that really like you, but you're like, oh, I don't like him, he's a bit boring. And yeah. There's always something. That's what's interesting about it, isn't it? Because it's like, if you have that mentality that you're not good enough, you're then gonna seek out relationships with people who will never make you feel good enough. That's, it's cruel, and, it's yeah. a cruel cycle, but it ha- this is how it goes, yeah. unless you're aware of it. This is how it goes and yeah. And so how do you think you become aware of it and how how do you overcome it? Like, does it come from a deeper rooted place than just, you know, social conditioning? Is it is it about our relationships with our parents sometimes? Absolutely. So people think of trauma as like the big car accident where you think you're going to die. Mm. But it can be growing up in an invalidating environment. You know, parents that don't necessarily give you praise when you've done well. They just give you praise when you've done super well. So mm. now you feel like I have to be perfect in order to um, in order to be good, in order to be good enough. It might be getting bullied at school, so now you don't feel good enough because in year three you were the person that was always left out, mm. or you're in that friendship triangle where there was always two friends and then the mm. third one, and you was always the third one who's trying to get in there. So you got the messages early on. Remember that from when we're born to like seven, we're really looking around. We're like sponges. We're learning how to do life from the experiences we have. So if you're in a household where people are constantly criticizing you and not necessarily because your parents are bad people remember there's no playbook to how to be a parent it's hard Mm. and they've got their own stuff going on too so they're dealing with their emotions and you're coming up with your you know you've made a nice drawing or something like that you're like mommy look and they're like oh yeah fine you're like oh okay (laughs) this is not good enough little things like that which again people do because if you don't know then you don't know really so these things stick with us. And it's obviously even worse if you've got people who are actually uh, physically or emotionally abusive, but it doesn't necessarily need to be that far. It can just be not getting the validation. Or if you, you know, you might cry in some families, being sad and crying is not tolerated. It's too uncomfortable. Mm. So it's, what are you crying for? Is there anything to cry for? Do you want something to cry for? Like, what is this? So all these kind of things that people do not knowing the uh, damage it can do, uh, sorry, when the person's older, can have an impact and it's done subconsciously. So we hold on to that. Then we replay scenarios over and over again. We wanna make it right this time. When I was younger, people didn't, um, people didn't like me or they didn't love me. These are core beliefs, which aren't necessarily true, by the way. They don't like me, they don't love me, but this time, you know, I'm gonna, this person, they feel familiar, mm. which usually feels familiar because maybe you've grown, the, the difficult situation you've grown up, you know it. Growing up in, sorry, you know it. So you get move on to a, a person and they maybe are a little bit colder towards you or don't give you the validation. You're like, it's okay. Something goes off, actually, an alarm. You get that chemistry. It's the opposite. Like You literally like, oh, I like them. But you like them because it's triggering something from yeah. back then that you want to fix. This time they, I'll be validated. This time it'll be okay. Mm. Um, God, it makes so much sense, doesn't it, when you put it that way, about why we make bad choices in our relationships over and over again, because it is that sense of, like, you don't realise you're doing it to yourself. It's it's a form of self-destruction. No. Um, is, it, is it about noticing that there are patterns in the people Absolutely. that you are having relationships with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody always, but there's, I can't find the pattern. I'm like, there's a pattern. There is, let's, let's find it. There's a pattern somewhere. It could be some, oh, I, I like really, really funny I don't everybody I like is just really funny and really confident okay cool that's not an issue that's not mm. a red flag there's something else underneath that did they text you back when they said they were going to text you back no but they text me back the next day <laughs> and I'm like okay did they um did they actually turn up for the date? Mm. did they compliment you did they let you speak all of these kind of things that when you go on social media you'll have people saying um you know these rules have to happen and people saying these rules have to happen and then you're going to go in and be like well she did this or he did this but they didn't do that some people are going to say have very clear boundaries about what they want they're going to know themselves they're going to know red flags and they're not going to care about what social media or their friends their aunt or uncle say about it they're going to say this is not acceptable to me Mm. that's a solid person because it's hard to do that if you've got a person who 
is just desperate for approval, they're going to see all of these things. And we know, we know, we know, we know when a person's not being consistent and they're dipping in and out and we don't feel like that. But if we are desperate for approval or maybe we're just getting a bit older and we're worried, fear-based dating is really dangerous as well. We might let things slide. So the key is, as you said, to, to look for the patterns. What was the commonality in all of these people that you were dating? And it's not about what they look like or even what they sound like, their actions. Pay attention mm. to what they were actually, how did they show up? Is this something that you'd be comfortable with for the rest of your life? Remember, when you're dating, everybody's putting their best foot forward. Mm. This is the best bits. Are you comfortable with the best bits? Mm. If not, then it's hard, but we have to take a step back. And so in the book, you talk about this kind of five part model that you developed. Mm -hmm. Explain to us what that is and how it works and I guess how you could apply it in a scenario like the one we've just been talking about. Yeah. So the, the five part model is actually a really commonly used model within the clinical psychology community, I would say. And it just helps. We use it in what we call formulation. It just helps us to piece together the cycle that somebody could be stuck in so we can find out our exit points. Mm. So we have our thoughts, our feelings, our physical symptoms, our behavior, and of course our environment or the thing that triggered whatever particular thing that we do or don't like. So we have a situation, it could be, uh, let's say you're going to do an interview mm. and maybe you've never done an interview before. So you're gonna have a little bit of anxiety. That's absolutely fine. Anxiety can sometimes motivate you to work a bit harder but maybe you had an experience way back where you did some public speaking, could have been at school, mm. and people laughed at you or you didn't feel comfortable. That stuck with you. Remember, there's there's a really good book actually, well, it's, it's an old book, it's called The Body uh, Keeps the Score. Yeah, 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 I know that book. And they talk about how trauma actually gets trapped in the body. Mm. So we hold on to a lot of stuff that we don't even know uh, subconsciously. So we are approaching this interview now and we are interpreting this interview as a threat. We don't know why, but it's like it's a threat. We're really, really anxious. Then we might have the negative thoughts come in. Negative thoughts are gonna be based off of our core beliefs. If our core beliefs are, I'm amazing, people love me, then you're gonna go in, you can have a nice time. If your core beliefs are, I'm not good enough, I'm unlikable, I'm unlovable, then the thoughts that are gonna come up with your approach is, I'm gonna mess this up. Mm. People are gonna laugh at me. This is gonna, why did I decide to do this? What's going to happen when our thoughts start going? Our body reacts. Our, our threat response is very, very automatic. It doesn't got time to figure out what's a real threat or a fake threat. If you say going into this interview is a real threat, then your body's going to be like, okay, cool. What do we need to do to keep you safe? So your heart's going to start beating fast um, and maybe your stomach starts churning. So these are the physical symptoms that come from the anxiety, so that's the third thing as well. Sorry, so we've got thoughts, mm. we've got physical symptoms, we've got the feeling, which is the anxiety, the depression, the sorry, the low mood, the sadness, whatever it is. Because we are interpreting the interview as a threat, the feeling is usually gonna be anxiety or fear. Our body's gonna react to that. So those are three parts. And then the fourth part, the fifth part, should I say, is the behavior. This is key, the behavior is key. So what we usually do when we're really scared of something is our anxiety goes right up, right? And when it gets to the point where we feel like we can't deal with the anxiety anymore, we leave. We're like, I'm gonna call in sick today. Or, oh no, I've got a stomachache, I can't go. And then when you avoid the situation that you're scared of, your anxiety goes right down. And that feels really, really good. You get that feeling of relief. But that, that feeling of relief is quite bad because it just reinforces avoidance. Mm. Had you stayed in that situation, your, your anxiety would have naturally gone down anyway because adrenaline doesn't last that long in our body. But also, whilst you're in the interview, you're gonna see that there's no threat. It's absolutely fine. And then there's less evidence uh, to keep your threat response going. And now the next time you go to an interview, if you stay in the interview, you're not gonna automatically be like, that's it, I'm done, I am confident, this is my day job now. But you're gonna be less anxious than the last time and you do it again, and you're less anxious again. However, if you avoid it and you don't do it, you just reduce any opportunity to see that it's okay, and to see that even if it's not okay, you can handle it. We massively 
overestimate threat, mm. like day-to-day -day stuff. Texts, you send a risky text. I haven't texted back, ah, what are they gonna say? I said something wrong. And you're also underestimating your ability to cope with whatever comes. We can, you've, most people, especially if they're anxious in relationships or work or whatever it is, they spend a long time that way. They've done a lot of hard things, but they forget that. Automatically it's, I can't do this, I can't do this, yeah. I can't do this. I think, and I'm very much like this, I make my life a lot worse for myself than it needs to be just because of the way that my brain works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm constantly, worst case scenario, getting anxious about things that haven't happened yet, might not happen. And, you know, these are all things that you talk about in the book. I guess let's go back to anxiety specifically mm. because I'm really interested in how this affects our relationships, mostly because it's ruined a lot of mine. Mm. But <laughs> I guess I want to know from you, you know, how can it affect the way we behave and also how it's different from an anxious attachment type um, and why it's important to kind of clarify those two things um, because I think they are different mm. um, but just general anxiety I guess let's start with that um, you know how do we overcome how does that affect us and how do we overcome that do you think so like I mentioned before the key thing is behavior mm. avoidance is like fuel to the flame big fuel to the flame if we want to overcome anything we're anxious about, even if it's like a mouse, if you're scared of mice, mm. you need to start working towards holding that uh, that mouse. Mm. And the person's gonna be like, what? That's absolutely not. But you start small. So if you're in a relationship and let's say that you're really anxious about, and this is the thing, when it comes to anxious attachment as well, they are distinct, but anxiety as a whole, it works the same way. Mm. It's just a fear of something, right? Mm -hmm. If you have, if you're in a relationship, sometimes you have a fear of losing somebody that is based on your own stuff, completely your own stuff. That person is a lovely, secure, reassuring person, but it's your stuff that you automatically go into failure mode to um, I'm going to lose this person mode or I'm going to mess it up. Now that could be because of attachment trauma with, you know, your primary caregiver. You've developed an anxious attachment because maybe they were, I guess, too attached to you as a baby. If that's a thing, it is a thing. Too attached to you or not attached enough and they didn't meet your needs. So I guess, it, it, yeah. So it could be because of that or it could be because of you've had recently had a, you were fine. Mm. but you've recently had a really bad situation and now that's stuck with you so then you've got that trauma so and I would separate that from an anxious attachment mm -hmm. because your attachment style usually develops much earlier on although it can be changed in a secure relationship so that's good sometimes though especially if it is an attachment issue it can be both as well it can also be the person that you're with because mm. for some reason Anxious attached people seem to always get with avoidantly attached people. And they do this constantly doing this mm. dance of back and forward. Um, and sometimes it is actually like the person is not creating the anxiety, but maintaining the anxiety with the way that they deal with you within the relationship. A across both though, um, whether it's just you or it's you and the person you're dating with, the, the things that you do as a result of feeling anxious, those behaviors, we really need to hone in on those, figure out what they are. And then we need to see whether or not it's an appropriate response, given whatever, you know, given the threat or whatever it is. Little things like, um, let's say that you got dressed up to go out with your friends and your boyfriend or girlfriend comes down and they don't compliment you. So now you're like, oh, they think I'm, I knew I could never get it right. Like I, I don't look nice. And now you've gone out of the evening because you know your partner didn't make a song and dance about what you look like. And then you come home and you start asking them for lots of reassurance. Or didn't you see what I look like today? I got dressed up. You didn't say anything about it. Like, do not fancy me, whatever it is. Your partner's like, what are you talking about? Like, sorry, I was busy. I didn't even notice. Mm. 
and they were genuinely busy, but we're asking that constant reassurance. And actually, if you're a person who is invested in a relationship and you've got somebody else always doubting your investment in the relationship and your commitment to the relationship because of their own stuff, then they're naturally going to get a little bit... If, the, if you're not having the conversations with them about how you struggle in relationships sometimes and they're just, you know, thinking what's going on, then they're going to struggle with the constant need for reassurance. Mm. Some people say that, you know, your partner should always be willing to give you the reassurance. And whilst that is helpful and that is so lovely in terms of the kind of psychological way it works, the reassurance is almost like the avoidance of it restarts it again. Like you're never going to stop needing reassurance unless mm. you're able to get it from yourself. Sit with the uncomfortable feeling of maybe this person doesn't think I look good. Do you think you look good? You don't need to ask anybody about anything that you're doing because first and foremost, you understand that you've got this. And if you don't, you'll figure it out. You're already good enough. Mm. That's, abs that's your core. I'm already good enough. But again, when we don't have that strong, solid core about who we are and what we bring to the table, we're always going to want somebody else to tell us if we're doing good or not. And it can get quite taxing for the other person in the relationship to have to always um, experience that. And that's on a low level, asking for reassurance. Mm. You might have other people that, you know, he, um, they didn't text me back. And maybe not official at this point, they didn't text me back. That's it, I'm done with the whole thing now. Because um, you're anxious and you're like, this person's gonna leave me, let me leave them first. Yeah. All of these reactions, sometimes it's helpful to do that, but we just need to make sure that everything that we're doing in, in relationships at the beginning, middle, end, wherever it is, is coming from a place of security in us. If we can say, I didn't do this because I didn't feel good enough, mm. then we can actually say that's a them thing. Yeah. So it's interesting because I think we, we all have that in us somewhere, don't we? That kind of self-belief and self-confidence. But it's mm. about getting to a place where, like you said, you're overcoming, you know, childhood trauma and, and previous damaging relationships and trying to, I guess, make that little voice louder than the mm -hmm. other voice that's telling you that you're not good enough. Yep. So aside from, you know, recognizing all of these things and recognizing these patterns, how do we get to that point? Um, and there's no, I guess there's no quick fix, mm -hmm. is there? Because it's going to take, it's going to take a while and it's about self-development. But how, yeah, how, how do we get there? Because it, it sounds too good to be true. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a thing. Um, and it's a, it's an ongoing thing, I would say. Yeah. And what keeps me personally focused and acting in the way that I want to is just defining how I want to act. Mm. How do I want to show up? What kind of person do I want to be in a relationship? And make get really granular with it. I want to be kind. I want to be compassionate. I want to be confident. I don't necessarily need to feel these things. I don't need to think that I can actually do these things. I can just be aspiring to be these things. But I just need to have the intention and try to do it. Our emotions are going to come and try and throw us off track as with our thoughts because our brain is designed to look for problems and solve them to keep you safe. So if it thinks there's a red flag based off of this looks similar to what happened the last time, beep, 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 it's going to try and do all of this stuff to tell mm. you to back off and you, you're going to feel it in your body and all of this is going to feel really uncomfortable. But if you have clear direction, that's your compass point, that's single track mind, that's what I'm doing. I'm in the middle of a really wild argument or it's about to get into a wild argument, but my values are to be kind and respectful. How do I still argue, but still stay kind and respectful? That's just an example. So when you have these in mind, you learn to not let your emotions, and that might be a little piece of work in itself. And that's sometimes where therapy or the book <laughs> can be really helpful, but you learn to not let the emotions dictate mm. how you show up. Because it, the behaviour is how you sow the seeds and you need to be really, really careful about what seeds you're planting in your mind and other people's mind. If you don't want to be seen as this really insecure, chaotic person, because you know that that's just not how you want to show up, but you know that people, sometimes people will say things like that just to be mean. But if you think there's some truth in it, actually, okay, cool, how do I want to be seen? And be very, as I said, get granular, be very clear about it, write it down. Have a word of the day. I love having a word of the day. If I'm going to have a really busy day, there's a lot of stuff to go wrong. I know that when a lot of stuff go wrong, goes wrong, I'm going to start, my negative voice is going to start up really, really loud. So then my word of the day will be self-compassion. Mm. 
that's what I'm focusing on. And it's, this, it's not about anyone else, but it's just me, self-compassion. So then my internal voice gets really soothing. And now I'm like, okay, cool, I've got this. Mm -hmm. So in a relationship, your word of the day can be anything, but you just need to be very clear that whatever you're choosing to focus on is the thing that's gonna get you towards what you want. So if you want a successful relationship, write down what that looks like. Then write down the qualities that you need, not the other person, the qualities that you need to have in order to get to that. Mm. And then take it from there. What does it look like? What's, what does a, a kind person do? Yeah. Do that. If you're constantly outsourcing your own care to mm -hmm. your partners, you'll just completely, you know, when that relationship ends, you're going to be completely at sea. Absolutely. And it can go the other way as well. If you have fears of abandonment, then maybe you can be even more avo avoidant. Mm. So you're like Miss Independent. You can't yeah. do anything for me. And the person just ends up feeling useless. Mm. Um, so definitely need to understand, which is hard to do if you don't have a manual, you know, but understand where does your behavior come from? Mm. Where does your thought process come from? What voice do I need to listen to? Just because a thought is in our mind doesn't mean we need to listen to it. We have 10,000, how many thousands of thoughts every day? Usually we choose the ones that we think are going to get, we choose the ones that have the biggest emotional impact, but we don't need to choose any of them. We can literally just put one foot in front of the other and keep a blank mind. Mindfulness is amazing. Mm. As long as you're doing what you need to do, it doesn't matter if your thoughts say, go girl, or don't do it. You can still put one foot in front of the other. Same thing with your emotions. You can feel anything and still do what you need to do. Emotions are really powerful because they need to be, because they keep us alive. And if they weren't, we would die. <laughs> we wouldn't pay attention to them. <laughs> but actually we don't need to. Sometimes our threat system is too sensitive. Mm. So we can't always listen to it. Um, let's go back to overthinking, because mm. I think that's also incredibly interesting when it comes to relationships and you know, recognizing, like I said earlier, the damage that we're doing to ourselves by kind of indulging in thoughts that are not helpful to us. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to someone who is, and this is a very selfish question because mm -hmm. this is all about me, that's my podcast so I can ask what yeah, I want. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> how do I stop overthinking everything? <laughs> okay, so that's, this is a million dollar question. Yeah. And I'm going to say something really annoying. It might not be annoying because some people love mindfulness, but I know it was really difficult for me. Mindfulness. Mindfulness is amazing. It is just, attention training. Mm -hmm. If we are overthinkers, then we are giving our attention to every thought in our brain that does not need our attention. And we need to train the muscle in our brain, let's just say that to keep it easy, to be able to sit still. Mm. But without training it, training it, specifically training it, just like we go to the gym, it is not going to be able to do that. It's gonna be very, very weak. In fact, we're creating, we're making the pathway that overthinks stronger every time we start overthinking things. Mindfulness, which could be, you know, sitting down and listening to an audio on YouTube or whatever it is, or it could just be when you're washing the dishes, pay attention to how, I mean, I have a dishwasher, but you know, how things, the soap suds mm. feel in your hands, um, the sounds of the water, the warmth or whatever it is, and just really focusing in. And every time you're distracted by a thought, which you're gonna be, mm. you just bring your attention back. That's the win, that's it. Noticing when you're distracted and bring your attention back. People say, oh, I can't do mindfulness. So boring. Yeah, I think it's I think it's been branded badly because yeah. when you say the word mindfulness, yeah. you just think of like the woo-woo wellness exactly, industry. Exactly. And actually yeah. when you break it down, it's really helpful. <laughs> exactly. It's not, it's, I hate woo-woo. I yeah. hate woo-woo. If you would have said to me 10 years ago, you're going to be, 10 years ago, how old was I? I don't know, maybe 15 now. <laughs> um, that I'm going to be doing mindfulness all the time and talking to people about it. I would have been like, Abs no, why? It's boring. Mm. Um, but actually, no, it's a workout. It's mm. attention training. It's learning how to much more quickly notice when you've been distracted. That's half of the problem with overthinking. You are overthinking about something for five, 10 minutes before you realize that you're overthinking it. So it's noticing much more quickly when you're distracted and being able to bring your attention back to whatever it is is actually meaningful, important much more quickly as well. Mm. That doesn't mean that at the beginning, you're not still gonna be an overthinker. I think the most helpful thing I would say to do, and the details around how to do it is in the book as well, but is to time box, time box your, your thought, uh, time box your thinking process. If you're always thinking about a million things throughout the day, you're wasting a lot of time. Mm. You're wasting a lot of time being present with the person that you want to, that the person that you're dating, with your friends or your family, your job, 
just in your head, stuck in your head all the time. You're not experiencing life. And people can notice that as well. So actually, when the thoughts come up, and maybe they are important, sometimes the thoughts that we're thinking about do need a little bit more exploration. Sometimes they are problems that need to be solved, but just not at that time. So you can just make a little note every time you've got like an idea or overthinking or a what if, make a note of it, whatever it is, make a quick note in the notes app on your phone and save it for later. Mm. When you've got half an hour, don't make it too long, but you've got your time to overthink, worry, whatever it is, save it for then. And when you get to your time, your worry time, now you've got this list of all the things that you didn't get to think of earlier in the day. But I think what helps in setting the time is that early in the day when you're overthinking, you can say to yourself, okay, this feels important. I don't know if it is yet, but I'm going to give this my consideration later. I'm not going to miss it. I'm not going to forget it. It's still going to get explored, but just later on. So you give yourself that permission to not think about it now, but also that reassurance that you're not going to miss it. Because sometimes, mm. you know, it's like, it's like well, if I don't think about it right now, something um, bad might happen. So when you come to your overthinking time, usually most of the stuff on your list, you're like, this was never a problem. I don't even need to think about this or talk about this or problem solve. Some of the things are going to be real issues that need to be problem solved. So you problem solve it. Overthinking is not problem solving. You problem solve it for and against all the solutions that you can mm. create solutions and then you fix whatever it is that is taking up space in your mind yeah <laughs> that is very helpful noted to <laughs> all of that thank you um going back to the things you get asked about by your followers what are some of the most common things that people want help with usually people just want to feel better mm. i feel it's anxiety I would say, and it could just be because of the things that I post on my page or the people that follow me. So it might be a bit biased, but people have a lot of anxiety. Some, a lot of people have low mood as well, but anxiety is a really, really big one. And anxiety in relationships, yeah. not necessarily when they've broken up, but just how to hold on to a relationship and worried about it going. Mm. How, uh, anxious in the morning. Some I have younger people who have got exams, they're really anxious about their exams. Uh, the physical symptoms of anxiety as well people always struggle with mm. um what their friends family how to support other people so maybe they've come across my page or a post and they're like this is this person but i don't know how to talk to them about it like what should i say can you can you help them mm. so it's about giving them that language to support them i would say that's the main things anxiety physical symptoms of anxiety how to support other people and again, my page is gearing more towards, um, I guess, working age women as well. So there's a lot of job dissatisfaction, especially after pandemic as well, uh, that comes up. Yeah. And going back to breakups, when people do come to you with that, either it's, you know, they're having anxiety about an impending breakup or they're not sure about whether or not to end things with their partner or they're just reeling from the aftermath of a breakup. Mm. What kind of things do you advise to people? And I suppose what, because I, I think when we talk about overcoming heartbreak, mm. there's a lot of generic platitudes that people go to and resort to that are just really, really unhelpful. Okay, so pain is not something that we should try to escape. A lot mm. of the problems that we have is trying to escape pa pain. So if we are having a heartbreak and we then go off all the time with our mates and get drunk all the time, then that's just avoiding the pain. Do it sometimes. Yeah. You have fun, isn't it? But we don't want to avoid that pain. We have to move through it in order to heal it. So I would say use this as a create a project out of this breakup. Mm. This is this is going to be annoying to hear. What did you learn from it? I, and I can't say it any other way. I would I want to make it sound profound, but I can't. Like we want to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes again. We want to understand how did we get into this situation? What did it look like when we first started? What did it look like when we were getting rocky? And what did it look like at the end? Now you've got a, well, it's an anecdotal blueprint, but it's your personal blueprint. Maybe you've got a history so you can put them all together. Mm. And this is your project now. What do I need to do for me to make sure that I am not showing up in the same way that I did then because I do not want the same results again? People are basically the same like we're all just nervous systems walking around with emotions mm. so we all going to experience pain and want it and want to rush away from it without doing the work 
So I would say use that time when it's just you. If you are, if you've already broken up, now you've got time for you. And it's not just, you know, focus on yourself. Yeah, focus on yourself. But what do you do when you're focusing on yourself? So what I want to see is, as I said, the reflection, the exploration, Mm -hmm. the curiosity about how you got here. You're going to need to be able to experience discomfort whilst you're doing this because it's not going to be easy. Sometimes you're going to get a wake up call that you you didn't want and it might make you a little bit fearful, but it's necessary because now you need to navigate that. Whatever it is, maybe it was you that caused it. And it's not just this person that you've been, um, you know, talking badly about to your friends on WhatsApp. Actually, you had a part to play in that. Mm. But once you realise that, that's good because now I don't have to do that again. So I can take that particular problem that could be caused off of the table. Yeah, you have to do the work. I mean, in fear of sounding like Kim Kardashian, <laughs> Like, you know, not enough people want to work. Just get your ass up and work. You have to, like, particularly in the breakup. Like you said, like, it, it's it's an opportunity for growth. Absolutely. I guess. And that's what we need to kind of reframe it as. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that we start catastrophizing all the time. It's, 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 it's a human thing. We catastrophize because we can plan for the worst case scenario, right? But, okay, fine. Plan for the worst case scenario if you want to. But if it's making you unhappy thinking about it, then why waste your time? Focus on the facts. You had a partner you'll have another one. There's how many billions of people in the world? I know people don't want to hear this after a breakup, but this is the truth. This person that you was with for even 15, 20 years, you have a lot of material there. You have a lot of material to make sure that your next relationship, if you want one, Mm. if you want one, you don't have to. If you want one, you've got a lot of material to make sure that you don't at least have this experience again. Do not underestimate yourself as a human being and ability to, and your ability to, to heal. You will heal, it just happens. All you need is time for that. But if you keep what you don't wanna do in the healing process is to create more things that you need to heal from. Start dating all these idiots now. Sorry, idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Start dating all these unhealthy people that you kind of know unhealthy, but your friends are just like, just go on, it's fine. Mm. You know, let your hair down, you've been through a lot. It's cool, let your hair down, but just make sure you're not causing more trauma. Yeah. Um, so I would say that. And yeah, just focus inwards. What do you need in this moment? It's lots of hugs for yourself. Mm. You know, the walks are nice. The food is the, not, you know, emotional eating is never great, but, you know, looking after yourself, treating yourself because you you are fragile in this period, but also make sure you're doing the work too because you don't want to have, you don't want it to be in a situation again. Mm. Thank you so much. That's really, really helpful advice. I'm sure a lot of listeners are going to really appreciate that. Um, it is time for our lessons in love segment. So this is the part of the show where I ask every guest to share something they have learned about relationships. So Michaela, what would your lesson in love for us be today? So when you are in a relationship, with a person that you feel comfortable around. Mm. You kind of get the inkling that this might be the right person for you, but the fear comes up. Focus your attention on the thoughts that tell you that you can create any kind of relationship that you want, that you have the power to be able to do that, that you can show up in any way you want and make sure that your behavior is in line with the kind of relationship that you want. If you want a secure relationship, then you need to be a very trustworthy person. If you want a kind relationship, you need to be a very kind person. So model the kind of values that you want to see within your relationship and you can create that situation for yourself. Mm. So it's it's interesting what you said about kindness and trust. So do you think it's about, I guess, projecting the things that you want from your partner onto them? Almost, yeah. It's like it's modeling, isn't it? Mm. It's leading by example. Yeah. I can't control what anyone else does in a relationship, but I can control how I show up. Mm. And it doesn't mean it's a hundred percent gonna, you know, always be a win, but at least you know that you've done everything that you could to create the relationship that is gonna be the best for you and the other person. If you want a person that, you know, you can trust, then you kinda have to be a person that they can trust as well again, as I said, with kindness, with empathy, all of that kind of thing. If the person is really resistant, have the conversation around it. This is a really important value of mine. Maybe get some shared values. This is also a really good thing that I do with my clients as well. Shared values, when they come in, 
relationship values as a whole. You both know what these are, so you're both working towards them. Mm. So for both people in the relationship, you can show up in any way you want and how you show up will dictate the quality of your relationship. Your emotions are gonna come and they're gonna be hard and they're gonna throw you off track sometimes. That's okay, get back on the horse. Still be that person that you wanna be mm. and you will see the results of doing things in that way, 100%. Thank you so much, Michaela. It's You're been welcome. such a pleasure to chat to you. That's all we've got time for for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you have enjoyed this episode of Millennial Love, please do subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Acast or anywhere else. And you can now watch us uh, on independent TV if you haven't already been doing so. You can also keep up to date with everything to do with the show on Instagram. Just search Millennial Love. I will see you soon. Bye bye.